Welcome to this session. So um, today I provide you with a stream of um, the um, session that we should actually have had um, this afternoon. And uh, but it turns out that um, our room hasn't been hadn't been properly scheduled, and K105, the room we had been using uh, before, is currently under renovation. So um, it seemed to be most useful because it was quite on short notice to uh, just record the video and provide it to you um, so you can consume it at your own um, discretion. So um, in the last session, we uh, talked about, uh, or Simon talked about mechanics in particular. So it's an important topic uh, in, in terms of how to, um, you know, get, get the, the um, workings, inner workings of your game right to um, have proper functionality. Think is related to what we're talking about this session as well, which is balance and chance. Um, but uh, it focused more on how to realize how do you implement it in your system. Today we're working a bit more on the higher level and looking at more from a from a perception perspective of what chance and balance actually entails in a system, um, and that's actually quite um, quite relevant um, for you as, as as game designers, especially if you're thinking about the human interaction part of it, not so much about the implementation bit of it. Um, but obviously there's links to into both directions. So next week um, there will be talk about puzzles and UI, and so we're getting. As you notice, we're moving a bit more from the bottom to the uh, uh, towards the user, from the technology towards uh, the user interface in particular. But uh, for today, we're sitting in this murky middle layer where it's on the one hand using efficient mechanics, on the other hand dealing with the user's perception of what an application actually does. Uh, yeah, so chance, that's the key idea. And um, I think we are all quite familiar, uh, or should anyway be familiar with the idea of fractions and probability and, uh, you know, percentages and so on. That's something uh, which you learn in, um, in basic maths courses. Um, but it, it turns out that um, what we think probability is and actually entails is oftentimes not as intuitive and also strictly changes with the kind of uh, situation we are finding us ourselves in. For example, if you are asked to do a um, quick, um, have quick decision making, um, 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 a, a decision making problem where you need to re act rather fast, you're probably doing much worse uh, compared to if you have the time to actually figure out what the realistic uh, uh, value of something, for example, uh, is for you, for example. So uh, we we'll get to that in a second. Um, but there are obviously um, um, empirical evidence that suggests that. Um, probability uh, is not as well under may not be 100% intuitive. Uh, for example, if you think about a, a uniform distribution, so let's say uniform uh, values from 0 to 1, and you have a random uh, pick in this uh, range, in this distribution, and you um, sum up the all those individual variables that you pick especially if you have different distributions you will find that the resulting distribution of those random seemingly well, randomly picked variables will uh, accommodate a, a gaussian basically a bell curve or a normal distribution ultimately and that is fairly not not uh, this is not generally but fairly independent of the type of in the distribution you picked your random number of from in the first place so um, that would be um, quite unintuitive in, uh, um, if, if, when you look at it um, on first sight. There are different met methods to deal with this. You add a small amount of randomness, so you don't necessarily end up at the um, mean value of the distribution for the resulting uh, normal distribution. Uh, but overall, the, the, the issue is, uh, remains the same. So what it means is for us gamers, is or for game developers rather, means that if we have sufficiently uh, large number of draws from uh, random distributions we most likely end up with the um, you know um, again with a random distribution with a, a 0.5 probability um, at the center so randomness in, in some respect is self-reinforcing that's the key idea that we need to get across so um, even though we can have a bias in, involved um, but looking at it more from a rational perspective uh, it's important that players operate based on the expected uh, values of a particular um, um, action. So uh, you wouldn't want to give the player the um, ability to always calculate the um, benefit of a particular action or the, 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 the disadvantage or the payoff, negative uh, payoff of a particular action, the loss that he incurs. Um, but in principle, if we want to approach this any idea in gaming rationally, we always need to, would need to think 
uh, in terms of uh, quantifying the possible loss that we incur, the probability of that loss and the corresponding reward and the probability of it. And only this one would, give, uh, under the balance line, would give us the indication uh, which decision to take, whether I should take that particular action uh, with that particular risk. Um, but intuitively, um, especially if we use our automated, our instinctive skills, uh, oftentimes more, more skill related, we find that we're actually fairly uh, bad at understanding probability properly, or rather at uh, using probability uh, properly, or even if we are aware of it, we still defy it and uh, give chance a chance, literally. For example, gambling. We know that uh, uh, most legislations um, limit the um, bias towards the um, provider of, um, you know, gambling uh, venues um, to only have a you know certain return. So, for example, they can only uh, um, retain 60% of whatever um, people have put in, and the rest needs to be returned. But nevertheless, if gamblers were aware that 60% of um, whatever funds they would spend on gambling would be retained by that um, venue, they probably shouldn't gamble in the first place. So that's the key about um, this particular aspect. Um, and the important bit for us gamers here is to um, provide um, the users or the clients of the system, meaning the, ga the gaming community, with mechanisms that allows us to model the expected value that an individual can uh, achieve as opposed to giving them opportunity and time to develop a uh, you know, rational model of value. And that is often done with different mechanisms that we again need to understand uh, when we de design a game. How do we obscure the fact that we um, either want to drive the player towards a particular direction or give the illusion of chance, for example, so we keep uh, the game exciting while at the same uh, uh, time giving the player a um, um, you know opportunity for decision making. So just to explore the idea um, of of rational decision making briefly, um, for example, if we exemplified um, using numeric representation, let's assume for example a player can either have a win or loss. Let's say the win case. Um, would be 2,500 uh, krona, and the loss case um, would be um, 2,000 krona. However, the probabilities would vary. For example, 0.4 for the for the winning case, and 0.6 for the remaining case. Um, now we probably do it manually. Um, can multiply those ones. Right. And do the same down here. So, but the loss, we obviously need to represent it using a negative. Um, I always get the commas wrong. Um, negative value. So, and if we basically sum it up, we end up at. Um, a balance of minus 200 here for example so it will give us an indication that even though um, we may easily be lured into um, a decision by um, choosing the seemingly high uh, higher gain or win that we can achieve it's often the probability that's much more decisive in terms of um, making the final call and this is exactly where we are relatively weak at we are relatively good at dealing with absolute numbers in terms of win and loss but uh, mapping that to probabilities is um, oftentimes a downfall if we um, think about um, games uh, or real life in fact so and we need to represent it accordingly in games so um, part of dealing with probability especially if it's in a high skill environment uh, so where we need to be fast and uh, quick at decision making games is such an example it's quite important to um, get a get an intuitive feel of probabilities so um, so instead of calculating uh, uh, probabilities explicitly, based on experience by playing, for example, um, you can get a fairly good intuition uh, as to with as to what probability um, um, is attached to a particular card in poker, for example. So it's one of those experts, and um, we oftentimes have the problem that we don't. We, we, we may struggle here and there to see the bigger picture in the sense that if we talk about random distribution, um, it doesn't imply that um, we should always get a random pick, but um, if we have a sufficiently large number of random draws from a particular sample, we should 
arrive again at a random distribution, so which leads us to an obscured perception. For example, if you find that um, similar uh, repeated cards are uh, drawn in poker again, um, you, you, you get the perception that this card set may be skewed towards uh, representa representing those particular types of cards. So, uh, and we as humans are uh, naturally somewhat superstitious uh, regarding this. So we are quick at ascribing some sort of um, intentionality, either that or some sort of, you know, um, possibly even supernatural activity um, or superstition in, in the widest sense um, towards this particular action. So we suspect that the cards have been um, uh, mixed in favor of someone or shuffled in favor of someone else uh, and so on. So in fact, um, evidently uh, pigeons do much better at um, getting rewards right um, um, if they learn um, from 80 to 20 uh, probability buttons if they are pressing it. Pigeons get a lot better uh, since they don't ascribe those super superstitions as we do as humans. So it makes it a lot, lot, lot easier. And the key thing is there, um, if we talk about chance, um, we need to look from it at a subjective perspective. Of course, if we were to analyze a game and decision points uh, and the probabilities attached to those ones, we probably would be able to actually um, objectively determine the chance in a particular game. And that may, um, may be useful and helpful to some extent. But the question is, what's the experience for the player? Um, and aspects obviously uh, relate to number one, how the use of chance is distributed or randomness rather is distributed across the entire game. So is the uh, player, player repeatedly facing uh, random events or activities? Are those early in the game and define the game largely or later in the game um, uh, when the player doesn't really expect it anymore? I mean, the risk of having um, random um, activities early in the game offers opportunities, but it may also offer uh, um, or open us to problems and that the player may not be able to complete the uh, game or get uh, prematurely discouraged because he may fall behind um, his competitors if it's for example a competition game or strategy game or the like. Um, and obviously the perception of randomness also extends to our subjective being. So um, some people are do better in dealing with randomness. So they can expect changing environments, changing conditions, uncertainty in the widest sense, whereas other individuals are um, putting great effort into minimizing uncertainty. So even their gameplay would be represented this way. If you think about strategy games, um, they are those guys that are constantly uh, attacking and trying to uh, overthrow the enemy as quickly as possible in order to get a dominant role in the game. And there's the other ones that are more um, Em uh, emphasizing the guarding of their own um, um, castle or territory in a wider sense and therefore tend to um, control randomness. So even if there's an attack by an opponent that they're feeling control with respect to this. So, and this is pretty much the, the idea of, of risk taking in this context. So it's about uh, estimating those expected values and uh, potentially uh, uh, deviating from it. So a risk taker would have an intuition about what the expected outcome of a particular action is, uh, may or may not, however, deviate from that, uh, depending on the ability to, to take risks. So um, that's the key idea here. Um, risk taking strongly depends on um, the actual um, probability for an event, but more importantly, about uh, um, relates to the estimate of the probability that the user has developed over time. So it's quite important. Um, to give users a chance or be aware at least of their ability to uh, estimate um, probabilities over time, especially if they play games repeatedly um, or um, or not and so on, or if they have other experience from other games. So uh, an, a simple example, uh, merely here a knapsack, knapsack example, um, uh, which is also a more complex problem which I'm not discussing in this context, is here rather the idea that if you, for example, have a, a random uh, number of balls in a given backpack or a given, you know, um, bag, uh, and the player is free to draw um, a number of them, let's say three of them, the fact that you may or may not be um, replacing those, um, for example, in this, this is the original um, sample, so you draw three balls from it, and the outcome may look like this. The question, however, are you replacing those before the next player draws or are you leaving them this way? Because 
um, suddenly the, this seemingly random or this initially random choice by a given player affects the randomness of a sub a subsequent draws by other players. So any player who observed this draw um, will have a adjusted expectation of, as to what uh, ball he or she will be drawing in the next turn. So it's quite important to think about those things. Do we offer fair notions of chance to everyone? That would imply that we replace those balls before the next draw. Or are we f working with a finite set of uh, random samples that we are operating on? So it's quite important how you model and implement randomness as well. Um, it could also mean, for example, um, um, for different um, conditions, are you using individual instances of random number generators for individuals or are you using the same one? So uh, at the risk of having a certain uh, uh, bias um, for individuals um, over time. So. Those are kind of design, um, probably more mechanics decision, which we probably shouldn't touch up on here. But the idea is here, uh, really it depends on how you design randomness, um, um, really affects the expected uh, behavior of the player and um, also its effectivity of the game in the long run. So it's quite important. So um, this was basically the idea of chance. And the other thing is about balancing those chances. So how do we make it possible that players equally have a chance of winning or losing a game if you play multiple rounds, for example, um, and in the first place, uh, what other mechanisms we, we have at our avail? How do we deal with difficulties? So some players, are, again, similar to the idea of uncertainty, uh, do better with difficult circumstances, whereas others are a bit more um, challenged if they um, suddenly see a in, in, in sudden increase in complexity. For example, if your second degree bachelor courses are suddenly getting a lot, lot harder, there will be quite some people that may be frustrated and possibly even opting out choosing the new uh, direction of course and so on. Whereas other ones uh, would feel arguably challenged by it, but would um, um, take up the challenge basically and face the difficulty. So that's the a key idea here. Another aspect is um, the, the idea of um, choices. So players want to obviously uh, guide um, to some extent the outcome of their uh, activities, but they also want to have the perception of freedom in a wider sense that they actually had the um, opportunity to define the path of the game. So if you provide players with a clever set of choices, they may take different avenues or pathways through the game um, by having, while having a re comparable experience. So even playing a game repeatedly will offer them a uh, same level of challenge, if you like, but at the same time of, uh, be equally rewarding and um, obviously uh, extending the dimension and applicability of your game considerably. So chance is something we uh, briefly talked about. Um, and then other aspects also balance uh, or come back to the player personality. Many of us, uh, in fact, come back to it. For example, uh, the, the trade-off between skill with a strategy. So what's more important, a long-term view uh, on um, playing behavior for a particular game iteration, or is it more the individual player's uh, skill that is decisive? Um, then looking at game design as well, but as, as much as game design as, at, uh, as well as uh, personalities is the idea of competitiveness. So how can, can we ensure cooperative behavior in a game or competitive behavior uh, and so on and how, how relevant it's, is it and how does it relate to an individual's personality we will briefly uh, dive into this one then also think about the length of the game because a uh, game may be well balanced but again we need to um, recall it's quite important to keep the um, player's interest the uh, interest curve was uh, something um, that was talked about um, a bit earlier during the semester keep the interest curve reasonably high so players, pay, um, players stay engaged with the game other aspects are obviously uh, rewards, um, quite important. Um, how do we deal with those ones? How do we, how do we not overuse them? It's particularly important, um, and so on. So aspects are such as complexity of the game. How complex does the game actually get over time? And um, where do we leave space for the player's input in a wider sense or imagination or open uh, questions, gaps, and so on? and where do we quickly draw to a, a close and uh, lead to a completed story. So um, all those aspects can affect the balance or the perceived balance by the player. And it's a difficult task that I think the most important message will be here and will be a message at the end of this very talk as well, 
is that plague testing is the key because uh, as, in as much as you can analyze uh, objectively um, whatever balance um, has been achieved in a game, um, it will be very hard to assess that without actually having players play that game and um, explore these ideas more systematically. So um, just the baseline idea, so we're iterating through some of those concepts and elaborating a bit deeper uh, on those. One of them, for example, is fairness. So fairness is fundamentally the an idea that players, if they have a similar starting point but also similar skill set should have a, a similar well chance to um, to win at least at the onset of the game because again randomness may affect uh, fairness well may affect the opportunities over time right so it's the um, an aspect that needs to be borne in mind but um, the um, perception of fairness will ultimately stick with the user, or at least it will reflect on the perception of the whole game. For example, if a two-player game is inherently fair at the onset, but one player is constantly losing, he will ascribe his losing uh, uh, probably not to the game, but rather to his uh, the different skill set compared to his opponent. Whereas if the um, perception of the game being unfair uh, starts from the very beginning where one has an advantage over the other then it's far, less, far, far more likely that players start to ascribe um, their unfairness um, to the game itself so um, that is definitely something to, to um, bear in mind here so um, but there's also other issues for example uh, from the onset um, players may have very different skill levels and you nevertheless want to keep the game exciting it's a multiplayer game especially if there's a larger number of players involved the probability of having different skill levels obviously increases uh, significantly so and the idea is there um, how a game deals with this one so for example some notion of a handicap or um, um, challenge level could be in introduced into the game and make it consequently harder for the player to actually win. Um, but there's all the, also other ways of dealing, uh, using risk to model this one. For example, you offer players a, a higher risk um, of um, you know, losing, for example, scores, points, or whatever else, while at the same time offering um, greater um, possible gains if they actually overcome a particular challenging uh, situation. Other players may, may simply not take that option, that opportunity. Uh, and um, thus don't need to have an excessive skill set to, um, to, to deal with, a, to have a comparable game outcome, but obviously um, put um, more effort into the game itself. Um, another, the, probably the easiest way, however, to deal with this is to simply play multiple uh, rounds. So give players repeated chances, and if there seems to be a adjustment necessary between rounds, rules for example or the parameters of the game can be adjusted in the favor of the less skilled player so both of them have a chance to to uh, win the game if that's the desirable outcome of the game in the first place sometimes asymmetry is desirable so where an individual um w where the game is inherently centered about skills then it shouldn't be surprising that um, the weaker player um, frequently loses but um, if the game is meant to be balanced and fun and in engaging for everyone there's those are important aspects to be um, considered. So the easiest way of dealing with um, fairness is obviously the idea of uh, symmetry. So if you have a symmetric game concept, um, such as you know Quake Arena or many of those uh, ego shooters per se, or chess in principle as well, um, we basically have a shared characteristic that they all have sim symmetric start positions, not the same start position, but similar uh, opportunities, access to resources uh, or um, um, uh, capabilities um, at least at the starting point um, which would be the, probably the fairest way of starting a game so that's why chess is considered reasonably fair even though by um, default the white side um, start, uh, you know, starts however this is unproblematic since you can play over multiple iterations so you balance it up so every game to some extent has the risk of having a moderate level of asymmetry so um, while it may be decisive over multiple rounds you can solve that issue or by dealing with random assignments so in other games instead of uh, fixedly assigning um, the starting role you can randomly assign it um, as well for example by um, throwing a dice or whatever else um, but even if in sport games in reality even more so than in um, com or much more so than in the virtual uh, gaming environment um, we find 
benefits or find advantages that are lying in the meta game rather than the game itself. This is, for example, in football, soccer, um, it's it's really about the difference playing in your own um, um, home or in playing in the away um, stadium. So basically, a dominant um, dominance of particular fans um, in in um, the stadium will have an influence on the game outcome to whatever a little or strong. Um, extent so it's something to bear in mind so but games would be inherently boring if there wasn't an opportunity for asymmetry so while traditional games all those those, those um, uh, oftentimes um, yeah traditional and uh, skill centered games are oftentimes focused about symmetry in the layout chess again uh, asymmetry is sometimes desirable especially if you playing different characters uh, playing the same game but different characters um, for example, StarCraft is one example, or uh, Command & Conquer, the earlier ones, particular where you could play um, um, various forces, access versus allies forces that have different weapons, capabilities, strengths, weaknesses, and so on. Or um, Street Fighter is another game where you pick um, a particular role that you play. Civilization games where you pick a civilization from the get-go, which have very different characteristics. Um, but also traditional board games such as the Tafel game, the Nefa Tafel. Um, which are kind of a predecessor um, to chess has been have been taken over by um, chess. So and the idea is there that uh, in this particular game, quite interestingly, um, there's a king uh, at the center here, represented at the with those uh, white um, checkers here, and um, armies that are basically attacking the king, surrounding it. So it's inherently asymmetric, um, so uh, clearly dominated by the opponents, but the king's uh, move is to ultimately end up in one of those corners without being caught by those armies. So it's an asymmetric game, um, but nevertheless achieves some sort of balance. And the key thing here is to actually either try it out um, um, analytically, meaning you know mathematically, uh, basically seeing uh, what opportunities um, individuals have from different positions um, despite the fact that they may be overpowering seemingly but the other one is simply trial and error so let players play especially in the more complex one like the civilization games where it will be very hard to provide an analytical solution because of the uh, massive amount of different variables that influence the gameplay and the only solution you have is really to do test playing have different players play uh, different uh, civilization types and the players have um, different skill levels and see how you can balance this game uh, basically from there so um, but this is to be borne in mind from the get-go is your game symmetric or asymmetric so it's quite important the obvious uh, way of dealing with this to, to play multiple sessions and that's the case for both uh, for, for any sort of asymmetry if you want to balance out unfairness or randomness or whatever else um, you you can use uh, multiple sessions to ex uh, do exactly that and obviously change roles and so on. That's the uh, idea. Um, but yeah, so this would work both for symmetric and asymmetric uh, setups in a wider sense. Uh, in a symmetric sense, it would be probably to outrule any sort of superstition a player may have about the game. In the asymmetric case, obviously, it is to balance out the opportunities or um, chance that the players had from the start of the game. So that's the. Um, key idea. If we look at asymmetric yeah. games, uh, for particular, for example, the uh, strategy games that we are uh, acquainted with, like uh, StarCraft or uh, those kind of games, um, you often find if you are defining uh, working with a particular society, again, Axis versus Allies, they may have uh, similar or different uh, units that you can play and they have different um, uh, capabilities, but you nevertheless overall kind of need to balance both sides, otherwise the gameplay will be really biased towards one side. So one possible way is, uh, for example, um, here using individual entities and associating um, particular attributes to them. For example, uh, um, here Jeeps, APCs, so armed um, personnel carriers and tanks, and you attach um, armor uh, strength to it, um, the weapon, that are um, available for those particular units and the speed. So, uh, and then to simplify the idea, you um, obviously need to have some sort of numeric representation. So you allocate a value to each of those skills and specify um, some associated costs. So while from a um, user perspective, it's often um, um, much easier to deal with a mnemonic uh, when, when choosing a value, obviously you need to have a 
uh, quantified representation. So we would do something like this. So for example, low armor would be represented as value one, uh, weaponry as uh, value one as well, where speed, high speed would be a value of three. And um, you can contrast this to the cost for the respective unit, for example, Jeep uh, being the relatively uh, cheap, um, whereas a tank may have significantly higher costs. So if you sum up all the individual um, values then for the capabilities on the one hand and subtract them from the cost, you will find um, this could be a good way of actually thinking about balance. Because even though you may have stronger capabilities as a particular civilization or um, party in the game, uh, by moderating the cost, making, for example, an entity relatively unattractive uh, based on the high cost, you will discourage its overuse so, and therefore you will re-establish balance in the entire game, especially if the uh, interacting players have the same access to resources, you know, because ultimately uh, they need to fund this uh, based on um, some sort of economic models, something we'll briefly talk about uh, later as well. But you see, for example, in this um, exemplified case here is that the tank is relatively under or relatively speaking, uh, compared to the other units, uh, unattractive because the price is so relatively high compared to um, those units. So um, so it's really about adjusting those ones for uh, uh, different um, you know, uh, countries or sites of a game, for example, and really have a play test. So, but you notice the complexity is fairly high. So it's a lot of testing involved, not a lot of trying out um, of different capabilities. And it will, will be actually quite hard to differentiate between player strategy, so how a player uses different entities from uh, their objective um, um, you know, role in the game because different players again may have different approaches, uh, perhaps more conservative um, players um, dealing with you know, tanks or more uh, agile armies that use for example more uh, we weaponry and um, other uh, units. So in this case it's important to have different kind of player characteristics um, representing each kind of uh, side of the game. So playtesting is the key here. Um, so, um, but you can kind of do it analytically as well. For example, if you look at uh, rock, paper, scissors, you uh, will know that game um, quite well, um, I gather. Um, so you can, uh, the, 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 the game is inherently balanced in itself, right? So uh, we know that rock against rock doesn't have any effect. Uh, uh, um, paper beats rock, um, rock crushes scissors. And um, so basically with all those, um, um, with all those different uh, combinations, we can basically establish this uh, matrix here and calculate the, the overall um, balance. And um, in all cases, the individual opportunities for uh, one, you know, symbol or one 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 uh, draw basically to uh, break another one is, is covered. So even for the more complex one like uh, rock paper scissors uh, lizard Spock. Um, it's the same case. So in this case, we have ad additional entities, but um, again, the gameplay is balanced because the um, paper can uh, beat Spock and um, the lizard uh, can beat Spock as well. And uh, the lizard um, can deal with uh, affect the paper. So that's the overall uh, rule set here. So um, paper disproves uh, Spock in addition. Spock uh, smashes scissors and lizard is a uh, poison Spock exactly and rock crushes lizard. So by reintroducing those few rules, um, ah yeah, and scissors decapitates lizards obviously. How could I forget this one? Lizard eating the paper. So by introducing those additional uh, rules, we again have reestablished a balance even though two new entities, Spock and lizard, have been introduced. But overall, this game again is um, balanced. In, in the previous part, we mostly looked at um, aspects such as probabilities uh, to balance um, the, the, the um, individual's opportunities in a game, right? So uh, probabilistically, uh, for example, um, uh, rock, scissors, paper um, kind of style games where the equal chance exists among all players in principle, or in cases of asymmetries, uh, such as in particular strategy games, the idea was to play multiple rounds and deal with this this way. But another aspect is also to manage an individual player's personality and characteristics, not only skill compared to others, but skill uh, with uh, respect to the game itself. So in a single player game, uh, it's equally important to obviously keep a uh, player engaged. And uh, Mihaly Tsitsen Mihaly, um, I hope I pronounced that somewhat acceptable, um, 
he developed the idea of uh, flow in particular and uh, the idea was there to balance an individual's desire for challenge with its individual skill level so the idea is there that the challenge needs to correspond to um, um, skill level um, and that's quite the essential uh, point here and um, we, we know this concept uh, perhaps um, you have encountered this concept in, in, your, in your personal life for example if you're really immersed in some activity that you really like such as you know making music perhaps um, or uh, coding is a very characteristic uh, aspect so if you're really immersed in your activity and the task you're doing that you really forget about your environment and you're totally dedicated to that task um, and nothing else seems to matter for that time frame and uh, it also seems both inherently productive while at the same time challenging so it's not a primitive task you're solving a routine based task and um, finding this 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 is balance literal balance in terms of personality and challenge level from the outside here the game um, this means you're kind of in the zone you're getting into the groove and um, really um, um, performing your best um, and this is obviously uh, quite important for games because uh, skill uh, levels vary, particularly if it's about skills, so not so much uh, knowledge necessarily as opposed to skill. Um, then it's quite important that the system is somewhat adaptive to keep you in that flow kind of zone. For example, if um, a game is um, has a high challenge level and the skill level doesn't correspond to it, you have aspects such as anxiety where a player is uh, just afraid of the game and eventually uh, uh, will abandon it because uh, in the is constantly getting negative rewards in, in terms of punishments so losing constantly which will not encourage sustained use of the game or play of the game right while at the same time a player could also have a relatively high, a very high skill level and but not be challenged so it's a constant mode of relaxation that would not really be a challenge for from a game perspective and uh, even though relaxation may be uh, uh, positive there may be too many possible alternatives for player to gain this therefore he may also abandon or she may also abandon that that game so it's uh, really about keeping this perfect balance out of uh, of the skill level uh, of the individual player so keeping him or her at his uh, max and, and using the skills particular and uh, balancing the gameplay against it so that's the key key idea here so uh, one way is obviously some sort of um, continuous adaptation of the game which has its risks as well but uh, other aspects would also allow the player to skip easy sections um, you know for example when it's about skill development for uh, relative to the game so for example you're getting accustomed to uh, using particular tools or weapons or the like if you skip this section if the player is acquainted with this this would uh, obviously um, um, not challenge a high skill uh, player so in this case would be a lot of lot easier um, and uh, the classical way is simply to choose difficulty, right? So we can players actually can uh, indicate themselves what challenge level they want to play at. Because again, it may not only be personality, but also uh, attitude or intention of playing a game. So sometimes you want to play for relaxation and sometimes you really want to get immersed and uh, be challenged by it. So um, this, um, the, 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 this, this, this concept of uh, flow here was mostly related to individual personalities. But another point uh, regarding um, the balance um, is um, also considering the individual's um, choice. So not so much the challenge in terms of skill or uh, ability, but rather uh, having the dealer, uh, the, 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 the player, um, giving the player enough opportunity to have, you know, um, 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 choice and options uh, at his or her avail, but not so many to overwhelm. So, um, but it also means that the choice or the options that are available uh, need to be reasonably diverse. You don't want to have just dominant strategies where the player quickly learns, oh, well, you need to always um, have the kind of same kind of choice pattern to end up in a dominant situation. So many, you know how to uh, play the game basically, but literally play the game. Um, but on the other hand, um, while you maintain a large diversity and alternative pathways, balanced pathways, that's the key, that's the um, challenge here, um, you, you, you obviously want to um, keep the game player uh, engaged. So not just randomly searching possible strategies, but uh, things that make um, sense, obviously. So, um, but there's obviously again a balancing aspect similar to the flow idea that you need to balance the choice with the desire of the player so sometimes uh, um, um, alternative pathways or choice can be rather challenging uh, if not overwhelming so um, that is if um, the desire for the player 
to, to deal with those kind of aspects of the game, for example. So player wants to seek um, immersion and play, but doesn't necessarily want to uh, doesn't necessarily seek intense um, you know decision making. Then uh, it may he may feel uh, overwhelmed, right? On the other, on the converse, it could also be that the player may feel frustrated, and um, the idea is that if uh, choice and desire match, uh, then the player would ultimately end up in a um, good state and um, find the game engaging and um, interesting. So uh, one aspect, um, one important differentiation uh, here, uh, which is um, discussed in a really good video by uh, Daniel Floyd, um, and it, there's many other videos um, uh, by him about different aspects of game development, is really differentiation between uh, problems and choice. So it's really worthwhile uh, watching this um, uh, little YouTube clip. So you probably ideally pause this video, watch this in between to get an understanding. And the idea is basically there to differentiate between problems that uh, satisfy particular uh, goals um, as opposed to genuine choices that allow the players to choose alternative pathways. Uh, what's similar amongst those and what's different. And uh, he certainly does a good job explaining this. So I will just pause this video uh, here so you can just stop it and then uh, continue after you have watched this uh, YouTube clip. You find the link uh, down there. Um, um, but um, yeah. So um, after you've watched this video, you probably got a bit of a better understanding the, between the difference between uh, problems and um, choice. Um, that's definitely uh, worthwhile insights there. Um, but in addition to um, choice about alternative pathways, you can also include aspects such as um, risk taking. So some, pl some players may be more inclined to actually choose um, risk um, over, um, um, you know, um, certainty and progress in the game. So some players may want to bypass critical section of the game. Other players simply want to try it out and uh, accepting um, that um, high risks come with possible high punishment, but also high rewards. Whereas uh, the low risk low route will basically end up with a uh, potentially low reward, but also a lower risk of actually uh, losing out in as part of the game. So again, it's a optional strategy choice if you want to allow players in a multiplayer game, this may be very much so an option that an individual plays low risk, gets low rewards, but may succeed more than a high risk player that ultimately gets higher punishment. So this way you can balance the game while at the same time accommodating individuals' demands for challenge. Um, so that's a, um, quite um, a quite good way of um, perhaps bal balancing it in-game, um, and but giving the player um, um, intentional choices about the risk or uh, the reward they're willing to accept or willing to um, uh, sacrifice um, and as part of their chosen strategy. So it's not so much directly related to skill but really a conscious choice of the individual um, as part of the gameplay itself. Um, so in the um, Assignment 2, there was a fairly good example, um, and it's highlighted as Lick's list, uh, Lens 41, a second edition of the um, book. It's really the idea of uh, thinking about the differenti differentiation between skill and chance. So in the Assignment 2, you had, uh, at least for the game part, um, the idea was to have a component that has chance and skill. So you certainly have an element of randomness in there. You thought probably about balancing strategies, but also about how individuals could play out different skills. Um, um, and, uh, and this is, um, I think, the key about playing, you probably noticed already that play testing is the key element in actually figuring out how much, to what extent, can you rely on, on a player's ability as opposed to uh, chance. Obviously, obviously, this varies for the kind of target audience you are, you are developing for. If you're developing, uh, for example, for a family audience, so including uh, younger children and so on, you obviously need to put a, a greater element uh, on, a greater focus on chance as opposed to skill and uh, vice versa. Whereas if you dealing in a game in which you assume a relatively balanced um, um, chance and want to emphasize skill, for example, like chess, then obviously this is of um, um, lesser concern. So there's various questions you need to ask yourself when you, des when you design. It's actually quite helpful um, for, for future iterations, especially assigning three and four, when you um, need to think about uh, certain aspects of games uh, again. So um, 
the idea is more if the game is about assessing the player's, player's skills, similar to, for example, like an exam to some extent, or is it more about assessing a player's uh, ability to take risks, so which would be, for example, going for chance. So, um, uh, and generally, um, games that are associated with uh, skill, um, for example, uh, serious games are one. So the gamification of real-world scenarios mm -hmm. is an example of those ones where skill is certainly more important uh, uh, than chance. Skill is simply more serious um, uh, than pure chance. So it really depends about your game. How far is it, you know, competitive or challenging, or in how far is it more a casual game? Um, so, um, which um, you know is important when you think about your game objective. Other aspects include uh, the question whether uh, your game is somewhat, you know, uh, boring, just cumbersome, um, and um, but have necessary mechanics that you need to uh, get through. So, for example, I don't know, uh, dealing cards, uh, reshuffling um, certain elements, or reorganizing um, allocations of resources in the game, and so on, um, which appear tedious but uh, unnecessary to, for example, balance. Um, the, the question is there. Perhaps you can introduce elements of chance as opposed to just following rules um, to make that a bit more flexible and perhaps a bit more fun. So, um, yeah. But on the other hand, too much randomness can also be dangerous because then players uh, feel undermined in their uh, level of control earlier. We talked um, about this balance here that uh, when, when players um, face uh, too much randomness, then their skill is probably uh, of, of, of limited actual meaning and they're seeking for more control, especially if they're a high level player. So if they are close to a um, uh, nearly met an objective and feel like close to winning and suddenly by chance pretty much lose all their funds, that's definitely not a game um, that they would play twice. So it's important to balance those aspects and reward an individual's skill at the same time while in retaining opportunities for other players to catch up in the game. So that's something you probably dealt with to a considerable extent to avoid um, specific lame duck situations, for example. So and this uh, leads us basically to the idea also, um, what does skill mean? So I just use skill and chance, but we also need to look at um, the uh, physical abilities versus cognition. So it really depends on the kind of game you're playing. If you're, um, for example, looking at a first person shooter, um, the cognitive aspects may be secondary to your actual dexterity, your skill um, in, your, in your hands, your motor abilities and muscle memory. If you have played this game before, you have much uh, more or less automated moves similar to uh, playing an instrument once you have learned it, that you um, internalize it. So it becomes more dexterous uh, ex exercise as opposed to a cognitive one. Um, other Elements obviously like, like chess, for example, where dexterity is of uh, uh, less concern. I mean, we, we are all acquainted with the uh, with computer chess variants, so it doesn't really matter if you're able to place individual um, elements of the game and be individual um, uh, tokens in the game, but it's rather important that you think about strategy. So it's definitely more a cognitive task. And um, even though it sounds like um, a game is of either one style, either has one element or the other, um, it's increasingly uh, common that games integrate both of them. So, for example, uh, role-playing games have components where it's on the one hand on uh, uh, the focus on dexterity, so for example, fighting off enemies and so on and uh, playing as a team um, in, in a kind of uh, virtual physical environment. Um, whereas on the other side, um, um, puzzles may actually challenge the individuals and then it's really about cognition as opposed to dexterity. And which is a good way of balancing the game, but particularly for multiplayer games, a good way of mixing and matching uh, players' abilities. So some players may be better at, um, 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 you know, um, in, in, in terms of, for example, in fighting situations, whereas others may be more focused on um, solving puzzles and so on. So it's a matter of finding a certain hygiene factor, the balance between those ones that corresponds to the um, audience that uh, your your game actually has. So to, to some extent, if you really want just a first person shooter, it's probably cognition is of secondary uh, concern. Whereas if you want to have a, a multiplayer game in which it's about strategy and uh, particular multi-round games, then um, um, uh, putting an emphasis on cognition may be um, quite essential to keep players going and engaged with the game itself. Um, so the the 
another aspect of, of gaming in terms of maintaining a balance is also thinking about the game strategy overall. So um, games may be structured in different ways. Right now we mostly assumed a competitive uh, notion of gaming. So um, where players play against each other, chess again, or strategy games, individuals against the computer, for example, it's one option as well. Um, and the question is here, um, whether we um, need um, to, to consider the ultimate um, strategy in the game. Because while at the uh, same time we can think about them as um, competitive, many games allow you to form coalitions, for example, uh, in game, so ad hoc, or um, as part of the game setup in the configuration. If you like, when you start, for example, in a role playing game, you set up, be it act as a team uh, collectively. So it's quite important to think about what your game is like and how you motivate individuals to conform to the expected. Um, social behavior. So do you expect them to cooperate eventually? Do you allow it as an option or do you inherently want to enforce competition? For example, if a um, um, individuals inherently do better if they compete against each other, then there's little value in, uh, in designing a game that rely, uh, relies on um, or assumes cooperation because they simply won't do it if the payoffs, if the benefit, the payoffs are higher for them acting uh, individually. So um, that's quite important. <clears throat> So um, it's important to bear in mind. Um, and, and along with this goes the idea that um, the, the length of the game determines in how far you can keep the interest up. If you play a cooperative game, but it does, can't sustain the energy uh, of both players, which is actually harder uh, anyway than having a competitive game where um, simply the adversity may be sufficient to motivate players, um, then it's important to get the length of the game right. Again, matter of uh, play testing. Um, but also um, of, of um, providing the players with different setups, different alternatives that allow them to do that. One aspect um, which I find kind of, kind of worthwhile to think about um, the, the orientation of individual players is really um, the concept of social value orientation. So um, when we talk about competition and cooperation in particular, it's generally um, about thinking in how far am I willing to sacrifice um, my well-being or, or, uh, or reward uh, for someone else. So you see in this, this scale here, for example, again, we have on the x-axis a possible payoff in a given situation for oneself as opposed to a pay or a payoff for someone else. So, um, for example, individualists seek simply to maximize their own payoff. They actually don't care about the environment or about the alternative players, but simply seek to maximize their own payoff. Um, whereas, um, so that would be uh, around here. Um, but they are fairly indifferent about how the other, other players do. However, the altruistic player seems to intends to maximize another player's um, um, a payoff, so the benefit of the other players, and is fairly indifferent about his own uh, well-being. Right. So there are other forms, obviously, that are on the um, more um, de destructive side, either self or other other destructive side of the spectrum. But um, the idea is there that. Um, if individuals, for example, see cooperation, they are willing to, to some extent, sacrifice um, part of their own well-being for the well-being of another. So, however, if they sacrifice part of their well-being for demise of the other, for the disadvantage of the other, then it's considered more like competition. For example, uh, example thinking about um, now taking from economics uh, would be, for example, the airline industry. Uh, if a new player enters the game, then um, the existing players tend to drop their prices temporarily and just to force out the new or prevent the newcomer from entering the market. Uh, and once he or she has given up, they actually recover their pricing. So the, the idea is really there. They will sacrifice their in, uh, situational payoff um, just to drive out to, 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 to uh, disadvantage the competition in this particular case. Of course, we have extreme force uh, forms where um, the the um, individual really again doesn't really care about uh, one own pay one own uh, one's own well-being really, but it's ra rather just targeting minimizing the um, efficiency of any uh, you know the payoff for the other, so making his life really you know miserable in a wide se a wider sense, so uh, sadism or masochism, where it's really about. Uh, giving up oneself and being fairly indifferent about the other payoffs and that other one's payoff in this particular uh, context. Uh, uh, martyrdom, so giving up oneself in uh, to you know, supposedly for a um, 
better opportunities of the other and a combination of uh, the worst, worst possible um, outcomes for oneself and another sadomasochism. So um, anyway, but it's, uh, I just want to bring it up as a concept um, to, to highlight in how far we can differentiate between competition in a game being here and cooperation in a game. And uh, empirically, um, there is quite some evidence that uh, how humans actually um, operate. And uh, it turns out that um, while most of us are actually born with an individualistic mindset at the get-go from so for the child development phase, over time, people tend to be more cooperative than they are competitive. So whereas many indiv um, individuals stay individualistic in a wider sense, most of us actually render up in a cooperative mode where we actually want to cooperate with someone else. And only few of us actually tend to go for uh, competition uh, in, in the real world. So so it's basically a grown-up numbers uh, in terms of distribution or between uh, cooperation, individualism and competition. So um, this also means, depending on the game, you will find a crowd that is interested in developing and um, playing uh, cooperatively. So there's a genuine uh, intent um, to do that. It's just uh, about developing a game in a way that it retains the the audience is in, engaging enough for those the, for this kind of crowd to um, stick to that idea um okay one aspect how do we moderate um the individual's payoffs so payoffs here yes, can be positive or negative so it can be a reward or punishment and um it's important to get it right in a way because you can simply dump too many rewards or too much reward on an individual and discourage from further engagement because if suddenly the um, um, the, the their score increases tenfold um, that may suddenly give little value to individual scores anymore individual points so it's quite important to think about what is the ideal extent of reward but also the ideal uh, frequency so a player shouldn't be rewarded too often or continuously or you know based on time and so on but it needs to be meaningful it needs to correspond to to, to the achievements that individuals uh, have, 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 have um, done also, uh, rewards may not just be points, they can be quite diverse. They can uh, obviously range from um, points to praise, be explicit or implicit, meaning by other non-player characters or by the, uh, for example, by the game itself, uh, by, you know, indicating some sort of reward uh, on the title page uh, or achievement or next level and things like this. Uh, or uh, provisioning of items, uh, powers or... Um, attaching resources for the player so for, for increasing for example the uh, uh, life remaining life of the player um, or things like this so there's various ways in which rewards can be distributed but it's important to again get this right for example not to give too many rewards at the beginning and then uh, die down this will players will learn this um, and basically respond to that one um, so while at the same time it's important to balance the um, provision of rewards, also important to keep them kind of diverse, so not just provide points, for example. Um, so um, an important aspect is also to keep rewards going up to the end, because otherwise people, uh, people may not be inclined to actually finish a game to complete it, because um, ultimately rewards should be attached uh, to completion of a particular game, so it's quite... Uh, boring to bear that in mind. Again, there's no hard and sharp um, suggestions, but it's considerations that you would need to bear in mind whenever you design a game. What are the different aspects uh, and how do I distribute um, rewards um, for uh, players? Similarly, uh, it's about um, it's about uh, punishment. So um, we talked earlier about risk. So players consciously um, or unconsciously taking or choosing risk so they can take a high risk road with um, possible high uh, reward or high punishment so um, obviously any game can just consist of rewards whereas we see that to some extent in uh, serious games that um, rewards are um, increasing inher inherently increasing and open-ended um, but in order to measure an individual's uh, risk there needs to be an opportunity to also lose out so um, so a lowered reward or actually a negative reward, meaning their points are just deducted also or, the, um, or so on, right? Or it may be a social pressure that's exerted, for example, that um, the, uh, the reputation within a team, for example, is reduced as part of it um, and so on. But it's obviously very important to do this carefully and probably more carefully than dealing with rewards. Um, because different players simply respond differently to uh, setbacks. So it may simply uh, quickly discourage them um, 
from continuing the game in the first place or um, being destructive in terms of in, in the gameplay itself so actually no further no not further cooperating in your team if you're having a team based uh, game and this is quite critical because then it becomes pretty pretty quick destru destructive it's a lot easier to destroy cooperation than it is to play competitive because that would be some sort of default mode individuals can fall back to eventually anyway um, so it's very important to bear uh, different personalities in mind and how individuals respond to setbacks um, in whatever way. And uh, obviously you never know about the individual's uh, history in the first place, so there may be some associations that may be developed. Please remember, um, as mentioned before, every time we deal with chance or randomness, um, people may have different levels um, of uh, sensitivity to treating it as some sort of... Um, um, ascribing some meaning to that random event so being somewhat superstitious to some extent and this is actually um, quite important to be bear in mind when it's talking about punishment as well so because people may ascribe meaning to it where it's just a parameterized um, discount of the values they're actually experiencing um, so similar to um, another aspect uh, mentioned before and referred to um, in the in the external video is um, the idea in how far individuals actually have choice of freedom of uh, movement. So the question is there not only um, how much randomness is in the game, but also um, how, how much choice the player has, um, but um, also how much affects the actual gameplay. So sometimes players have choices and can do stuff, but it doesn't affect the, uh, effectively affect the gameplay, switching on a light switch and so on, but it doesn't have any meaning for the outcome of the game. Um, or, um, but it could be secondary aspects that, for example, switching on the light switch could extend your vision range and therefore make your, um, um, you know, um, tasks possibly easier, but it's still being an optional, um, feature of the game. So if you have sufficient, um, features of that nature, you can actually increase the complexity of, uh, of the game so that the player suddenly has experiences emergent complexity something that they didn't anticipate before and, or something that you didn't even anticipate as game designer before because you may not be able to consider all the different combinations so the only way of, um, of dealing with this would be for example to play testing and see how players behave what features they use or not use at all uh, and so on but um, obviously it can also be rather um, 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 intentional if you want to have uh, complexity so um, the, the the play could offer so many options that a player consciously needs to be aware of as opposed to being able to explore them trying out and see what it does but actually know them to play the game in the first place that it could be overwhelming so it's kind of a tricky bit of growing complexity to some extent so letting the players explore depending on their skill and challenge level and demands and their personality in the widest sense or do they do you force them to read like a 25 page rule book in the first place to do any basic activity in the gameplay um, so both pathways could lead to the same level of complexity but uh, the idea is you want to make it as easy for the player to to learn the game um, but ultimately, you know, uh, keep the learning, the challenge um, going. So to retain them in the high challenge level and therefore in the flow, uh, flow area. So the game has a continuous challenge that makes it very hard to master the game in its entirety, as opposed to just making it hard from the get go, because that's where you lose the most um, players anyway in, in this particular game. So it's really about thinking about if you model, model a complex game, how do you inject it how do you develop this over time as opposed to um, asking a player to deal with this um, at the beginning so so um it's another aspect which um probably links now a bit more to the idea of aesthetics so previously um the focus on chance um was more focused to in many respects to more the mechanics of the game but elegance obviously quite important as well right so um, um that implies both removing removing unnecessary features so you shouldn't uh, fear removing uh, features that are not deemed necessary either by a play testers or by yourself or simply by observation uh, should not be removed because this is unnecessary complexity which doesn't actually add to the gameplay to the value or to the experience of the individual um it is 
similarly also related to the nature of the game that you're having yourself is it really about um, you know um, fun functionality exploiting it comprehensively or about having a, a seamless smooth and elegant gameplay um, so in the real world for example the Apple iPhone is often associated um, with the idea of elegance and uniform um, um, control and user interfaces but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have the latest uh, hardware features or the richest functionality so it's important in your game to again to t decide for yourself where you do draw the line and um, cut complexity in particular and focus on um, pragmatism to some extent while keeping your game also a playable note that again uh, fewer features means fewer bugs so that may also be uh, in your advantage in the long term potentially um, when it comes to uh, wording for example instruction is quite important to be about uh, clear about this so having clear descriptions while being concise at the same time is quite important um, certainly players wouldn't want to read eight pages of wizard style information as we found in the early text-based uh, adventure games that we had where it's mostly about reading all the time uh, but nowadays either you have, would have a kind of small of a movie or narrative um, or you would really keep it very concise and uh, highlight the, con uh, the objective of an individual in one single sentence that's the key uh, idea about uh, being elegant in your in your game but again there's something is more to be covered in the area of uh, aesthetics again so this whole idea of chance actually navigates between um, the the, the um, lower level technical challenge and the higher level user-centric aspects such as their um, personality so um, Another aspect is again, uh, it's related to complexity of the game to some extent is also the deepness of um, the game. So whereas, um, whereas sim some, in, in some games the rules are very well defined and inherently clear, again uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors is one of those um, examples, uh, including um, Lizard and Spock. So, um, but it's not particularly deep because after two, playing it for two rounds, you know how the game works. You may be inclined to continue, but nevertheless, that doesn't make the game harder because in the end, it's just about a hidden action um, that you that you perform and um, that will determine the outcome every round. So um, having more deep games, again, relates to the idea of complexity and choice. Um, so the a game becomes deep simply if a player has uh, multiple alternative pathways to reach to the same goal and doing this with varying levels for example of complexity so if you can play a game uh, for multiple times and uh, potentially years and nevertheless can still come up with alternative options this is considered a deep uh, game experience so um, that that is to be explored not something simple so um, and that applies obviously for multiplayer games as much as for potentially single player uh, games. But again, um, dealing with deep games obviously has the challenge that you need to kind of design those alternative pathways and kind of strategically test them. But on the other hand, uh, there will be a lot of, um, the more alternatives you had, have the harder it will be to actually control them. So there will be new strategies coming up that players may actually come up with without you ever planning for it as a game designer. So uh, that's the key idea. And the key way of doing this, again, similar to uh, complexity is the idea of having alternative choices or options and the combination of those ones lead to new outcomes, new strategies or new decisions by the player that you may have not anticipated. So that grows complexity, but um, that's one, um, one way to think about it. So again, you may have more shallow pathways throughout the game or very deep involved pathways where the story gets uh, much more complex and involved and uh, um, basically the ultimate result may be a vastly different experience by the player while taking different pathways but ultimately ultimately reaching the same kind of um, goal that's set out as part of um, the game um, so yeah this would be uh, one one possible ways so if you think about um, action games they uh, um, sometimes have missions so different variants of missions could lead to largely different outcomes or decisions that you make during those missions will uh, lead to different successive missions and um, uh, basically in the ideal case lead to a totally different experience or development of your character for example while at the same time you're reaching for the ultimate goal of achieving something yeah. so that's the key idea um,
Um, poker is another example, that's the obvious example here. So um, it's all about guessing what the other player has uh, or not has. So um, but playing multiple rounds makes you, get, makes you guessing better, but it doesn't make the game deep. So it's not a, a deeper strategy as behind it. You will develop um, more intuitions, probably superstitions with respect to what other players have in terms of cards. But other than that, poker is in principle balanced and fair and um, um, playing it multiple rounds um, will not um, change chances in your favor or another person's um, favor. So um, the only way of variation that you can basically have is um, since cards are dealt randomly is like really the um, strategy in, in principle. So um, and obviously you can extend it um, as with all games you can have a meta game that actually um, you know um, focuses on the game itself in a sense that you can bet on the game outcome for example as you can bet for the outcome of a soccer game or bet on an election which is basically the election being the game and the meta game uh, the betting on it the possible outcomes um, so that would be another um, option that is obviously included here but other than that poker wouldn't be considered a particularly deep game um, if you are in scenarios where players are notoriously behind and there's no way of catching up anymore, like Duck would be the idea, um, there, there is a, um, you will need to consider how to exit those players early because there's little value of keeping them uh, hanging around in the gameplay for much longer. Um, either you could actually provide them positive feedback and uh, to um, you know, leave the game. Um, an example, what I think is realistic in real life, would be to um, th think about if you play um, soccer world club, you um, may actually play for the um, uh, rank three and rank uh, four position in the in the um, ultimate result, even though you're effectively the loser of the entire world cup already. But nevertheless, you play for a third or fourth, so he has a positive feedback associated with actually losing to the top two cont uh, contestants that's the key idea here so but the idea is here to make it as painless as possible for the losing party and similarly if there's a checkmate um, um, there should be no value in playing anyhow further uh, because no further move should change anything for the uh, winner uh, or the loser so one side one side has lost um, there should be a quick way of ending the um, game ultimately um, some of the mechanisms to um, deal with the um, games sometimes important to uh, know what this functionality means so it's more like a terminological sense uh, problem here but uh, for example the double blind idea is that uh, in to maintain balance it's uh, particular for not deep games such as uh, Rochambeau which is um, rock paper scissors um, the American uh, term for it is to actually more make choices simultaneously. So all players uh, autonomously and at the same time make the same make their choice and oops um, but obscure their choice and basically just um, come up with that um, choice at the same time. So it's no 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 value if uh, you would do rock paper scissors with one person going first, for example, right? So whereas in fighting games it's a bit trickier because on the one hand you need to gauge an individual's moves, on the other hand you need to have an opportunity to counter any move. So um, you would need to consider this in your um, in the actual um, 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 game, the technological realization and how far how do you model action and reaction times, for example. So and which moves are can be used to um, disable the other um, player's attack, for example, right? So. Um, or block it in a wider sense. So that's that's quite important. Um, another one, another mechanic that would be uh, simultaneous would be diplomacy. So suggesting um, possible um, compromise between both party and accepting it. On the other hand, um, maybe one one of characteristics as well. So um, the key thing is uh, double blind actions are the ones that um, neither player knows about. Um, um, with respect to the other one so that's that's quite important um, uh, to, to bear in mind not all games know that so sometimes it's it's okay to actually um, highlight your choices so um, chess being an example where one player uh, plays after the other so we actually the choice is very explicit and clear and you have even sufficient time to react to it but uh, for less deep games um, the, the double blind approach is usually the um, um, default realization so um, 
for you as a game designer, if you like to explore uh, using testing, for example, um, balance and chance in your particular game, um, two techniques that are highlighted in the book as well are the idea of doubling and halving. So if you have a um, sufficiently large game space and you really find that people have trouble exploring it in its entirety, or that it's biased, for example, based on resources for either, either one particular party in the game, it may be worthwhile just simply doubling or halving that game space to have rather large changes in the um, you know in the environment, board, or so on. And um, this will allow you to quickly um, qu quickly identify um, the impact it has. So um, if you notice that you have the, um, the the game board, the playable area of the game board, and suddenly one uh, player type or role type does significantly better, you at least know in which direction the balance is pointing if you do this. Um, and then you can fine tune by um, incrementally adjusting this uh, game space again. So it makes it a lot makes it a lot easier. Um, yeah. And apart from this, it also trains the, the idea of uh, guessing those, uh, having like an educated guess with respect the, of the impact that those changes actually do in your game. Because ultimately you're coming up with a new game, you're designing it, and in as much as you can uh, think about all those elements in advance, it's important simply to play and to test them and also train your understanding, your intuition about uh, the game um, when you want to further refine it or introduce what would be the implication of introducing a new role or a new player to the game how do you can how do you balance between three and six players in a particular game and so on so um, it's really about important to do rather at times drastic changes just to understand your game better before fine-tuning it um, and to get to the best possible outcome. Just by changing one individual value and replaying the game may often not be sufficient to identify uh, um, its impact on the game, let alone that you probably need to play it multiple times to really be sure that um, um, changing one particular um, element has really made a um, significant change. So it's a lot easier to look at um, the, the bigger picture of the game and actually um, modify there and explore. Um, tricky one is obviously when you by um, build games that um, have multi-layered structures. So economies are such those, they are inherently complex, the key idea. Um, so there are en uh, entire um, degrees that actually just about um, structuring economy. So political science uh, economics obviously uh, is related to that, that field institutional economics. Um, and there's really about um, thinking about how do we balance individuals and centers to cooperate, what are the resources they can get, how do they spend them, how do we motivate them to spend, how do we motivate them to build as opposed to, uh, um, or, uh, to, to save or how to construct. So how can individuals uh, start um, developing savings and so on. So especially if you're dealing with AI, it's quite important to get that right because it needs to resemble realistic human behavior. But it's quite easy to have a blindly committed agent that constantly spends whatever they earn as opposed to investing it into something because then may not see the bigger picture long-term value of having some investment. And especially if you're building larger societies that have suddenly, um, 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 apart from production or factories uh, and so on uh, that lead to concrete um, uh, value addition and so on. Aspects such as cultural centers or temples in the case of civilization, uh, the values of those are often hard to uh, quantify ad hoc, so it's really important to uh, test this intuitively. In fact, I think having a look at economics literature wouldn't be the worst choice, but probably the worst, the p first place to look at would be uh, Ernest Adams' works because they have um, um, he has developed or came up with quite a number of uh, books on different aspects of game development and there's one which is really worthwhile thinking about um, uh, looking into it's the um, Game Mechanics Advanced Game Design uh, book by Ernest Adams and Doris uh, Dormans and um, they are looking precisely among other aspects precisely at that how to develop uh, more complex uh, me mechanics such as economics how do we they develop them from the get-go and they analyze uh, several games and highlight the uh, particular get, um, mechanics that are used there. But um, instead of going into that one, Ryan, Ryan, something to be aware of if you want to go beyond a fighting game, for example, but have a more uh, economics-focused uh, game. Um, but there's obviously also a thinking about um, um, ways of um, managing 
ma managing the 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 uh, emergent outcomes. So again, if you have economies, you will have some players ending up rich. You have inequality in the game. Some ending up poor, and especially if you have a large l number of players, there will be a rather uh, considerable distribution between their uh, performance over time. So it's important also to think about. Um, um, finding mechanisms that benefit the weaker players and still let them uh, participate in the game either by cooperating or competing amongst each other or by introducing new um, uh, models that are um, relevant of use to um, the weaker part of the um, uh, players or introduce the idea of uh, suddenly sourcing new resources to perhaps uh, make up for um, um, disadvantages in their um, resource levels for example so to avoid a lame duck situation so how can you uh, motivate them to continue um, playing this would be one other aspect that could be um, of um, concern there so but anyway um, I think for rel relatively straightforward games where uh, you deal with an individual player and its performance it's um, quite manageable to start off with intuition and game testing but if you want to build richer economies you will need to go um, beyond this and actually explore what others have done and find good and not so good examples um, to uh, advise your choices. One thing about auto balance, earlier I was mentioning that um, the game needs to be adapted to some extent to the bait player's skills, ideally adjust to his skills to keep them in the flow. That's the, um, one of the possible uh, motivations to do that. Um, and there's various ways of doing that, obviously. You can adjust the points, you can adjust the power of an individual player if they are performing consistently weak. You want to um, increase the impact of an individual attack, for example, um, or perhaps you, you have even um, uh, biometric feedback where you model a player's stress, um, uh, either using cameras, eye tracking, or other sort of um, skin sensors and so on. Um, but the the the, the 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 problem here is twofold. Um, number one is that you, when having adaptive, con um, consistently adaptive games, you lose the ability to compare performance. So if you, for example, have an uh, internet-based high score system or the like, there's limited value then to retain those high scores and compare because again, this, the game is adjusted to the particular player's uh, skills. And another aspect is also all, um, the player. Um, player herself in a way that as soon as they know about this adaptive features of that game um, the motivation is um, um, reduced to actually play cooperatively because the idea is then that the player plays the game in a sense that um, there would be an incentive to um, pl uh, well make the make the game uh, as easy potentially as easy as possible by playing as dumb as possible in the first place so really the game the player would not so much play with the actual game uh, um, challenges and mechanics that you have built in but rather just challenge the adaptiveness of the game itself so um, yeah so plus also I mean it would mean that the game constantly shifts its objectives um, towards the, the player which um, may really challenge the uh, prevent the player from actually retaining this challenge level because he or she was constantly played by the game itself because it adjusts its uh, challenge level. Um, so that's it's, it's obviously a tricky one um, but I think the most important point here is to bear in mind you pretty much lose the ability to compare with other players. So having online games and adaptive uh, behavior is generally not a good idea if you uh, plan to develop games. However, for a single um, player mobile app that's only running your phone, that may be a possible option, especially if you want to, um, um, if this application shouldn't have a particular large lifespan, for example. Cool, but uh, the most important thing uh, for all those aspects that have been discussed here to some extent um, is really it's about playtesting. So you can um, start uh, calculating probabilities and um, um, you know, uh, chances and uh, manipulate number of rounds people uh, play or determine the optimal number of rounds. But ultimately, the only way to really find this out is to do uh, playtesting. Have other people, it's not yourself, but other people um, to uh, test your game. And you did this for the second assignment. Um, at least there was the intent. And I think in many cases, people did this actually. Um, and um, this helps you um, identify a lot of issues, obviously, in the gameplay itself but also finding uh, bugs in the game, right? So that may be a semantic as well, um, you know, um, screen um, issues um, or UI uh, problems and so on, or layout issues and so on. And um, 
we asked you also as part of the assignment to actually look how players actually play and um, here it's quite important to uh, identify or quickly identify potentially dominant strategies so strategies players can blindly follow and they know they will win uh, throughout that game if you follow those uh, strategies so it's quite important to have metrics for those so some ways of recording this um, if you uh, if you can perhaps even automate it by having the game capture um, the um, actions individuals take or by observation but it's important that uh, someone else other than you as a developer of the game actually has a look at it so this is pretty much um, um, all about um, chance and balance for now so um, it's probably worthwhile reviewing the book because there's a con uh, quite a sizable chapter on um, this particular aspect of game uh, development um, but um, this should be it for now so um, it at least provides you a good overview I think about the different aspects of um, chance and balance but again bear in mind playtesting is everything in this particular domain especially since it's really about linking the game to the user on his personality challenge level and skill level 